Welcome to On Location, a production of Beatty Televisual Incorporated and the Digital Production Group. What you'll find here is a look at people, places, and events throughout the central Illinois area. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can dial it up on YouTube or at BeattyTelevisual.com. You can also write us a letter or give us a call at Beatty Televisual and we'll be sure to include your person of interest or groups, places, and events. So let's get started right here on location. First off, we want to bring you a ceremony that was held at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library on July the 2nd. U.S. Senator Dick Durbin was pleased to present the Congressional Gold Medal to Deloise McMurray. So here's a few of the sights and sounds from that event. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. I think, I think President Lincoln would have been very proud if he could have seen what brings us today uh, to his museum and library in his honor. These are the words that President Barack Obama presented at the ceremony a year ago, and I quote, despite being denied many basic rights, the Monfort Point Marines committed to serve our country with selfless patriotism, choosing to put their lives on the line. These men helped advance civil rights, helped influence the decision to desegregate the armed forces in 1948. Embodying the Marine Corps motto, these heroes paved the way for future generations of warriors, regardless of background, to serve in the finest military the world has ever known. The Congressional Gold Medal, uh, and that along with the Presidential Medal of Freedom being the highest award bestowed by our U.S. government. And the award is bestowed on behalf of impacts on American history and culture. I accept this medal for them, all of them that's gone. Oh, I could name so many, but I won't. I accept this medal for all of them, for all of those guys that are gone. As we continue on now with our pilot episode of On Location, we're going to be speaking with the Honorable Mike Houston. We're going to take a look at his first term in office and this term in office and see exactly what it takes to be mayor. Thank you so much for allowing us to come in and visit with you today. Um, Mike, what I'd like to know is what makes you tick? What, what, is, what is behind Mike Houston? Well, you know, if you uh, take, a, take, a, take a look at uh, my adult life, one of the things that uh, I've really done is be involved in the community. And I enjoy being involved uh, in the community. Most of that time has been spent in, in voluntary uh, types of, of activities. But uh, having had the opportunity to, to serve as mayor from 79 to, to 87 and then uh, having the opportunity to, to come back in, in 2011 is, uh, is really sort of a dream come true uh, for, for me. I'm, I'm really enjoying the opportunity to, to do what, uh, what I do. And most people say that, you know, are you crazy? Why do you want to do this? There's, you know, too many problems in, in that, that type of thing. But I, I really, really enjoy it. And it's uh, an opportunity for me to, to give back to the, to the community but more importantly, to, to try to move the community forward. And uh, the city of Springfield, both in terms of the community at large as, as well as city government, faces some, some real challenges. And how we handle the challenges today is going to dictate what type of future we have on a long-term basis. Now, you just said the hot-button word, challenges, because for some individuals, change is hard. 
and you have a lot of challenges in this decade that we're in currently. So how do you prioritize different things and how do you move on with them? Well, first of all, if you've been in this world for any time at all, this has been decades of, of change. You know, one of the things that uh, I had the opportunity to, to do between the time I left City Hall in, in 1987 and uh, came back in, in 2011 is I was in the banking business and uh, I spent 24 years in banking. And banking was changing almost in its entirety every five years during that period of time. Mm. And one of the things you learn very, very quickly in terms of being in the real world is you really have to change because if you don't change, you're just gonna fall by the wayside. And change is happening all over. One of the challenges facing city government is that when I left city government in 1987 and came back in 2011, basically city government is operating the same way in 2011 that it did in 1987. The services are, are pretty much the same. In many ways, we deliver the services the same way. What has changed is the internet, computers, cell phones, and when you add that to the equation, almost everything within city government has changed, yet the basic way we deliver services is the same today as what it was in 1987. And the real challenge is to, to make city government more efficient, to be able to take the resources that we have within city government, which are, are very, very limited, and no one wants to pay more taxes, and use those resources in such a way that we can improve the product that we are, are delivering and actually provide a better level of service to the people of the, the city of Springfield. You know, I, I would remind you that on the day that I walked in to, to city government, we basically had a city government that wasn't functioning very well. Is, that, is it better now, though, with this form of government as opposed to what you worked with the last time? You know, um, what we have to, to look at is what we are working with today, not what we worked with in the past. The mayor automatic form of government is what is dictated by law. It does absolutely no good to think in terms of what things were in the past. What we have to focus on is what we're working with today and where we're going into the, into the future. So that when we, we talk in terms of trying to, to be more, more efficient, one of the first priorities that, that we had was trying to get the city's financial house in order because it's hard to be able to deliver services, number one, if you don't have money to, to do it. But you really can't be doing a lot of things till you get the basics down. Mm -hmm. And when we walked into to office, which was April 29th of 2011, the average daily balance for the corporate fund, which pays for all the basic services of city government, for the entire 220 working days of the previous fiscal year was just a little over a negative $3.5 million a day. Now, when you're working with a balance that's just a little over a negative $3.5 million a day, you can understand why the city was having a hard time delivering services. So one of the things we did was we began to, to look at, at how we structured city government, the number of people we had in city government, and in that first 10 months of the remaining fiscal year, we took that negative $3.5 million plus a day and turned it into a plus $728,000. And we ended this last February 28th, our average daily balance was just a little over $2.8 million. And that's a direct result of having a good management team that actually manages city government and manages the budget. It's not something that just happened. It's a matter of really managing city government and the budget. And that isn't me. That is the team of people that we have. And right. every department head that we have is held accountable for their budget. And they really have done a very, very good job in terms of trying to take the resources that they have, reduce them where they can, 
and put the dollars into providing services to the people of the city of Springfield. And I think it, it is, in fact, paying off. So where do you see the city five years from now? Well, first of all, five years from now, I, I hope that uh, we are in, in much better financial shape than we are today. Okay. We continue to, to have financial problems, and I'm not saying that we've solved the financial problems. What I will say is that we definitely have turned the corner. But we also have problems in terms of underfunded uh, pension liabilities for both our police and, and fire uh, pension funds. We have problems within uh, the utility in terms of the electric division has been, been losing money. And part of that is a result of what's happening on a, a national uh, basis in the price of electricity. Those are, are two problems that remain to be solved and we need to constantly work on those. Five years from now, I really hope that we have funding in place and are really moving along in terms of the 10th Street corridor because as we look at the future of the city of Springfield, to me there's nothing more important than getting that 10th Street corridor in place. Well, I certainly appreciate being here today and I thank you very much for all your time you've given us and I'm hoping that we can reoccur at some point in your life and come back and talk to you again. Sounds good, Kurt. Right, Have a great day. There are those people that work in our city that actually make our days a little bit brighter. We went and talked with Amy Minighetti of Cool 101.9 to see exactly what makes her tick. Here we are today at Cool 101.9 FM with Amy Minighetti. And Amy, thank you so much for inviting us in today and no uh, to talk to us here on our pilot program. Mm -hmm. um, really, uh, we want to find out what's going on in your life and where you come from and what you're all about. So okay. let's start with that. Where, what is your background? Where, where background. do you come from? I come from Springfield, Illinois, right here, and proud to say that I do. Born and raised here, went to St. Joseph's School, went to Ursuline Academy High School. Went away to college in Northern California, where my dad's sister lived. We used to go out there and visit all the time when I was little. And uh, just decided to get away from the Midwest for a little while, take out and go out to California. Had a great communication school. Graduated, uh, came back here, and boy, I started my career in radio at WTAX, running St. Louis Cardinal Games and the Rush Limbaugh Show, which was a real treat, let me tell you. But um, <laughs> then I graduated and did some uh, overnight shifts and some fill-in shifts at WDBR. And then um, did morning for DBR for a little while, then um, got fired from WDBR. <laughs> and well, that, that happens with a lot of radio it does, stations it does. because of uh, ratings and whatnot. Right, so. right, and I have a bad temper. And uh, anyway, um, then they uh, Saga Communications, this is our, our parent company, they decided to start another radio station. They already had YMG here, WYMG, and they thought, hey, let's put an oldie station on the air. So myself and a gentleman named Dan Marcus and Steve Goldstein, who's the corporate program director for Saga, we all worked together for weeks and weeks and weeks, and it was really neat to see the inception of a radio station, you know, see what you have to do to actually get it on the air, you know? So ultimately those radio waves were WVEM yes, at one time. they were. So what was it like to do the transition between uh, that sort of format that they were putting out there mm -hmm. and what you wanted to start up? Well, it really was just a blank, blank piece of paper, you know, because it was ours now. We took the signal away and we definitely knew that we wanted to do oldies. So it was nice to have different models of different oldie stations because Saga owns about 65 different stations throughout the country. So we kind of modeled after a lot of those stations, but we also tried to put our own personality on it and introduced the station um, in 1993, I believe. I think it was in November by playing Louie Louie 10,000 times. <laughs> and that worked. It worked. People were like, what's this station, you know, because people were familiar with the 101.9, but all of a sudden the music has changed. Right. So we. So what happened after that? You, you left Springfield. Yes, I was there at Cool for about five years. I left Springfield, um, went to upstate New York and worked there for about three or four years. Loved it. Beautiful part of the country. Did mornings. And then I moved down uh, to Florida. Tallahassee if I No, or. I moved down first to a place called Titusville which is right across the bay from the Cape Canaveral where they shoot up the what do you call it 
Rockets. Thanks, rockets and shuttles. <laughs> that's it. So um, I worked. I worked there, and I did evenings in Orlando. So I was doing radio again. I was doing afternoons. I was doing evenings. I'd fill in for mornings, and then a morning show job came available in Melbourne, Florida. So I went down there and did mornings for four or five years, and then I left there and went up to Tallahassee. Lived up there for about five or six years and did mornings again. I've just been all over the place, a vagabond. <laughs> and uh, then I went up to Cheyenne, Wyoming. I had an opportunity to try TV. And, ah. yeah. Well, what what uh, progressed you into television from radio? Then? You know, it was just it. It's just an ever shrinking business. You know, I, I was at a state. The stations that I was at in Tallahassee had five stations and thirty six full time people when I started. And when I left for the job in Cheyenne, there were six full time people. So the computers are taking over the world, and the people they don't need as many bodies. So I mm -hmm. thought, why not try? TV. So I moved up to Cheyenne, Wyoming. I reported and did weekend weather. Didn't like TV. Just didn't didn't fit with me. Not not uh, spontaneous enough. Not fun enough. Very serious. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and ultimately, Wyoming was maybe a little bit smaller market because yes. of just the population of Wyoming. Right. Period. Right. And, and yeah. uh, so then you came back to Springfield. Came back to Springfield because they sh they laid off a ton of us and moved in with my father. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> and uh, got a job in Peoria doing weather on the weekends. So I did that for a while. And then I called my good friend Liz Willis at YMG and said, hey, you know what? I'm back in town. Let's go out and have a drink. And she said, are you back back or are you just back for a visit? And I said, no, I'm back back. And she said, oh, my gosh, the guy that replaced you when you left 12 years ago is leaving. So I called the manager and I said, hey, can I come in and you know try out? And he's like, sure. So came in for a couple mornings, tried out. Made me sweat for a couple of weeks, and then they gave me the job at Cool. What a wonderful twist of fate. I was very, I mean, timing in life is everything. It's right. really interesting. Right. And welcome back. Of Thanks. course, we don't have to say that. You've been around now <laughs> another, what, four years? Almost three or four, four years. years. Yeah. Uh -huh. Almost. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So tell me, um, why you've been working here, evidently last uh, holiday season, you had a promotion uh -huh. that actually won some award. Yes. Tell us about that. 30 Good Deeds in 30 Days. My idea behind this was... I feel like at the holidays, all of us radio stations and TV stations have our hands out going, help this cause, help that cause, which is great, you know, toys for tots, food, whatever. But my idea with this was the opposite. I thought, you know what, I'm going to go into these nonprofit organizations, and I was doing, I was, said I was going to do 30 good deeds in 30 days. A good deed was constituted by two hours. So they called me or I called them. I got my whole 30 days organized, and every day... I would go in, I would talk to them on tape and, you know, tell me what your organization does and um, tell people what I'm doing here. And I would be there for two hours and then I'd come back and I'd talk about it. And I'd say, you know what, we have so many great nonprofit organizations in Springfield. It's just amazing. It is a and giving community. It is. Absolutely. And uh, I said, you know, if you have a chance to volunteer just once a week, because I feel so good when I volunteer and I wanted people to know more about these organizations, give back my time and learn more about them and give back in the way that maybe people be a little more educated as to exactly the nonprofits we have around here. So who recognized this as being a Illinois uh, Broadcasters Association? IBA, yeah, right? The so IBAs. during their Silver Dome Awards, is yes, that correct. Mm -hmm. um, and when was that exactly? Uh, last year, sometime around. I think it was like last May. Oh, ultimately, <laughs> understand you're you're quite an athlete. <laughs> And I, you I do go run. out and run, I and run ride your bike. I run a lot. I run a lot from the law, and I run a lot in Oak Ridge <laughs> Cemetery because I love it. There's no cars. There's hills. It's peaceful. I love to stop and read some of the tombstones when you know I get winded or something. I love running up and down the steps in the back of the tomb. It's great exercise. I mean, it's just it's all natural. It doesn't cost me a dime. I can go whenever I want. So um, I've always been a big advocate of running and biking. Um, so, well, I want to thank you for your time today. No problem. And for allowing us to come in your studio and mm -hmm. and uh, talk with you and get to know you a little bit better. Good. Uh, hopefully this won't be the last time you're on our program. Hopefully and we, not. We hopefully have you back at some point. Okay. And um, When you get desperate, call me. Yeah, well, <laughs> we don't have to be desperate to call you, Amy. Uh, Lying. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Well, it's just about time for the 2013 Illinois State Fair, and we will certainly be out there to cover all the activities that are coming up very shortly. 
Right now, though, the barns are being ready, the food vendors are on their way, and we sat down to talk with Amy Bleefnick, Illinois State Fair manager. And Amy, um, it's such an honor to be here, and thank you very much for being on our pilot program today. Um, I'm wondering if you could kind of give us a little background about Amy. Where'd you come from, and what led you to be State Fair manager? Well, the most interesting thing is my career goal in life was to never have a job, and look at me. <laughs> you know, I uh, actually wanted to be a housewife and a mother and a community volunteer, and I was very blessed that I'm a housewife, a mother, and a community volunteer. Um, and I have three great children and three great grandsons and a, a, a great husband. But, you know, this has a, a, a been a great opportunity for me to be the first female state fair manager in the 160 year history. And I'm currently the longest state fair manager in the uh, history of now, the Illinois State Fair. This will be my ninth fair. Ninth, ninth fair. Ninth fair. And so Goodness. it's been a real pr privilege and a pleasure for me. My dad and mom used to bring us every year on Veterans Day because we could get in free, all veterans and their families get in free. And so the fair has always been a tradition in my family, but my background's in event management, so it seems to be a perfect fit. Now, since you've come to the fair, nine years, that's an awfully long time. So what are some of the changes that you have brought to the fair? Well, I think for me, it's very important to remember the historical value of the fair. The fair began 161 years ago as a way to celebrate agriculture in this great state. And so agriculture is still at the for forefront of everything that we do planning-wise. Over 10,000 animals are here during the fair. That part's really important for me to keep. But I think it's important also to bring a little extra flair every year. And so what we try to do is bring good quality family entertainment at affordable prices in a place where a family can go walk down the street, holding hands, just enjoying a beautiful day. Now ultimately um, there are some uh, price changes as every year we get to it. So do we have price changes for this year? No, in fact we're very happy to say that we have not increased our fees this year at all. It's still the, one of the most affordable fares in the whole entire country. Our admission fee for adults is seven dollars, for children and seniors it's three dollars. Veterans and their families get in free on Veterans Day. Senior citizens get in free on Senior Citizens Day. And the last day is a bargain, $3 a day. So it's still affordable. And once you get on the fairgrounds, there we have 14 free entertainment stages. We have Kids Corner with free activities for kids to come and see and do. We have Happy Hollow full of great animal acts and activities. Which and is always fun. Oh my gosh, so much fun. Right. Now, ultimately, um, it's a 160-year-old fair. So what uh, what may be new, something new that has happened uh, that you're going to be presenting this year? Well, new this year, we've got so many things new, but you know, like we're going to have a new cheerleading classic and that's going to be something new and different uh, that we haven't had in quite a few years. We used to have it all the time. We've got great entertainment at the Grand Strand. In Happy Hollow, we've got new animal acts. We're bringing on a bigger and better uh, CrossFit competition. We're having the cheerleading competition. We're doing um, show choir exhibition this year, which we've never done before. Uh, it's, there's just really so much uh, to see and do once you get here. Well, it, you know, it seems to me that there's so much going on at the Illinois State Fair that one person probably couldn't get it all in. Well, that's kind of what we hope. We hope that people come and stay and, you know, actually, you know, make a weekend of it. Come spend a couple days at the fair. Enjoy beautiful Springfield. You know, I think people forget the economic impact that this fair does play on the city of Springfield and the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. When we did our last study two years ago, we found out that $49 million economic impact to the city and to the state because of the Illinois State Fair. You know, visitors who come from all over the country, who come and spend a weekend here, stay in the hotels, utilize the city services and you know also we put lots of kids to work for the summer and so it's really nice to see these kids can come and earn their college tuitions working at the fair. Which it brings us to another point volunteers and also employees um, ultimately the state fair you online um, do request you know people fill out applications and all that so how is the uh, uh, employment situation and the volunteer situation uh, stacking up. Ultimately, where do you need the most help? Well, we hire summer kids all from for the whole summer and, and through different parts of the fair. We also utilize a lot of volunteers. We have our volunteers who man and operate our visitors information booths. They work in our state fair museum. They'll help us with different activities. And then we also hire, we hire volunteer groups who actually hire volunteer groups to work our gates and parking and admission. Volunteer groups help in the grandstand by selling beer and beverages and things so there's a lot of opportunities for volunteers there's a lot of opportunities for people to work and you know to make the state fair a part of their life now is there somebody in particular that uh, our viewers can contact um, that if they wanted to volunteer for anything out here 
in fact, it's really easy. We make it really easy. You can either call our office at 7826661. Go to our website because on the website has all the information about volunteers, working, activities, things that are going on during the fair. You can actually go on the internet to our IllinoisStateFair.info website. Plan out your day. What horse shows you're going to see, what time your favorite band's playing in which beer tent or which street activity, what time the animal acts are. So you can go to the website and find out anything you need to know about the fair. And the husband calling contest. I think that's ultimately one of our favorites. Well, you know, that's that's one of those things so that when you talk about traditions, the Illinois State Fair has, has had the husband and hog calling competition probably since the 50s. It's one of the biggest things every year during the fair. Uh, in addition to that, another tradition that's extremely popular is the the butter cow. You can always tell when there's a new person right. when you mention the butter cow and they're like, what? It's a, a cow made of over a thousand pounds of... Now, uh, who, who's doing that this year? Well, we have a butter cow artist, Sharon Buman. She's been the artist for the last eight or nine years. Okay. And she uh, uses a thousand pounds of Prairie Farms butter to uh, carve out a cow that actually represents the theme of this year's fair. Out of curiosity, I've always wondered, what happens to that cow after the fact? Well, being a very sustainable state, we, we save the butter and we freeze it so that way it can be used again and we can actually recycle the butter for two to three years without having to replace the whole thing. Wow, that, uh, that's a lot of biscuits over time. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, what, what's going on at the grandstand this year? Here we are. It's, it's kind of a cloudy, overcast day. And the stage is blank right now, but who can we expect to see on stage? Oh my gosh, you know, every year I think we have a great grandstand lineup, but this year we really have one of the greatest grandstand lineups we've had in a long, long time. You know, our, probably the biggest headliner we have is Toby Keith, who's going to be here on Wednesday night uh, of the fair, and Toby Keith with Kip Moore. But we also have other great country acts like the band Perry uh, with Randy Hauser. We've got uh, Billy Currington with Lauren Elena from American Idol. We also have uh, Thompson Square, Gary Allen, and Brush Fire, and three other bands on Friday night. Uh, John Mayer with last year's American Idol winner, um, uh, Philip Phillips. With last year's American Idol winner, Philip Phillips. And then we have Kesha. We've got Rock's, uh, Rock Superstars Journey coming, REO Six Head East. But you know, the grandstand's not used just for uh, grandstand acts. As you can see behind us, we have harness racing. They're, they're, they're practicing right now for the fair, but we also do USAC and ARCA automobile racing. And in the arena, we do truck and tractor pulls, demo derbies, quarter midget racing. I mean, there's just something for everyone at the fair. Cool. Well, Amy, thank you so much for coming out and talk to us today. And, and I'm sure that you're gearing up and you, you say now we're four weeks away. Now, ultimately, when you see this being aired, we're only going to be a couple of weeks away. So don't hesitate. Get out there and get your mega passes and actually just start checking out the schedule for the Illinois State Fair. Yeah, and I, I do want to remind people, you can get admission books if you're planning on coming out to the fair for several days. You can buy a book of admission tickets for a much greater reduced price. And so call our office or go to the Internet and find out how to get those in advance and you can uh, come to the fair many days. Wow, fantastic. Thank you so much, Amy. And Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us this week. If you have any concerns or ideas, please send them to us at Beatty Televisual, 1287 Wabash Avenue, Springfield, Illinois, and that's 62704. Or you can give us a call at 787-4747. Again, thank you so much. Thank you to my AAA production crew, that's Andy and Alexander. And of course, thank you to the viewing public.